All right, we're getting moving right along here with class number two, and we have a section 1.9, and we're talking about the temperature, zeroth law, and temperature scales. Uh, to be quite frank with you, I'm barely familiar with the zeroth law. It's not something that I uh, have uh, really dealt anything with. Um, I can see on a theoretical perspective why it's kind of needed, or fil not theoretical, a philosophical perspective, that's right. It, and, and interestingly enough, you know, all uh, scientists used to be called philosophers, right? Uh, the philosophers of the natural world kind of thing. Um, so I've been trying to uh, put together uh, uh, the foundations of a scientific theory or whatever. We need to have um, a, strong, uh, a, a strong foundation like Descartes, he was a mathematician, but he was also a philosopher. He said, I think, therefore I am. Is it, uh, when doing philosophy, you wanted to, it, the first step is to prove that your own existence. And so that's how he did that first step. And that's a foundational thing. So that's what the zeroth law is. So I just jump right into that guy. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, how do you, you know, how, how do you t talk about temperature? Well, the, the zeroth law helps us. All right, so we have this, we have these different, um, these main different uh, temperature scales, Fahrenheit, Celsius, Rankin, and Kelvin. And we want to be familiar with them. Um, I kind of think of these two right here as, you know, starting a long time ago where we had to have uh, uh, some references. And, and the easiest reference was when water freezes and when water boils. So they kind of, Fahrenheit kind of started with that. I think there's some other logic going on. So we know that water... Let's say water, I like to put water, freezes at uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit and it boils at uh, uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So the difference between those, the delta in there is 180 degrees Fahrenheit. This is kind of cut, pops up a little bit later uh, that, that when talking about um, the in-between uh, uh, types of thing, this 180 degrees Fahrenheit. It's kind of interesting. Um, well, let's like introduce it right here. We have uh, Celsius where the freezes. So it's a different scale and it's at zero degrees Fahrenheit and it boils not bare for Fahrenheit, it's silly, Celsius, da, and uh, 100, right? So the delta is 100 degrees Celsius. Well, if you take a look at these two things right here, and uh, you look at uh, down below, uh, you take a ratio of it, 180 to over 100, you get like 1.8, right? We'll look down these conversion factors, you get 1.8, right? 1.8, 1.8. But um, the conversion that you want to do, and I wish I had left myself some more room, if you have uh, the temperature in degrees, do I have a good place for this? Temperature in degrees Celsius, and you want to take, and you have uh, temperature in Fahrenheit, what you want to do the temperature degrees Fahrenheit, subtract 32 from it, and then multiply it by 100 over 180. And that will be your conversion. So you don't even have to memorize anything. Although you could memorize that that's 5 ninths. Instead of 100 over 180, you go 5 ninths. The same thing if you have want de degrees uh, Fahrenheit and you have degrees Celsius, Multiply it by uh, nine fifths. So they gotta make. Uh, did I do that wrong? Yeah, that's been, and then add uh, thirty-two. I think I did that right. Yes. And you can see this is down in the uh, in the book right here. But you could just memorize this because you know this difference right here because you have that one eighty and that one hundred. And you know that this, the, the Fahrenheit's larger than this, so you could just think your way through 
And now you don't have to um, look it up every time. And you can do it lickety-split during an exam, and you don't have to run out of time. Or you could just sit there and stare at the page. Um, I'm sorry about the squirt. If you have Rankin now, what you do is you take temperature degrees Fahrenheit, and you add 460 degrees Rankin to it. Right, so this is a this is an absolute scale, right? So that's uh, sort of like uh, uh, that same figure that we had drawn for pressure in the absolute scale, right? We had gauge pressure in the absolute. So right here is the absolute right here uh, um, that we, we talk about right here, and uh, so here's really what uh, like degrees Fahrenheit uh, Fahrenheit, sorry, is going to be. But you can also get the same, you'd get to the same spot here, it, with uh, degrees Rankin. But now it's just from this absolute zero, right? And it's, it, you know, they can get really, 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 really close to absolute zero, but I don't think they can actually get to absolute zero unless I'm completely wrong. But that was my recollection that they, that, you know, it's almost an impossible feat. Like you can't get to a perfect vacuum. You can get damn close to a perfect vacuum, but you can't get really into a perfect vacuum. Um, it's the same thing with uh, uh, Celsius, although maybe we would draw like a little bit of an offset. And that offset is that 32 because they don't have, you know, Celsius and Fahrenheit don't have the same baseline uh, for, for zero uh, because Celsius starts with the freezing and uh, uh, we, we, we actually go below zero for the, uh, 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 for, you know, so, so this, this is actually sort of like the, what we consider is a zero right here. It's a, it's a little higher uh, for the Celsius, degrees Celsius. And then, but I've also then here's the degree Kelvin, right? So it's all the same temperature here, but it's a different scale, uh, a different reference point uh, to make for it. Um, and like I said, I don't really think these, these these are actually kind of more confusing, I think, than the thing I described to you of the nine fifths and the thirty two, uh, versus subtracting the thirty two and, and then doing the five ninths uh, thing to get the uh, temperature. Um, so okay, so we have the zero. The zeroth law. Let's see if I can try to explain this. So the idea that if you had th this in thermal equilibrium, this A and this B, they're in th thermal equilibrium with each other, right? This was a hot temperature. This was a cold temperature. We put them together for a long amount of time. They become the same temperature. And then you do the same thing here uh, between A and C. Now, as long and maybe you keep doing it back and forth, back and forth. The zero says that these now have to be the same temperature, right? So if you keep bring these two into equilibrium, bring these two in equilibrium, and this thing, and they remain, they, this is in equilibrium with that, and this is in equilibrium with that, the, they have to be equilibrium with each other. Same thing with this. These guys brought in equilibrium, this guy brought in equilibrium. They have to become in equilibrium with each other. I honestly don't see the necess necessity of this, don't quite understand why we needed to go through all that. I am not really much of an academic. I'm an engineer. I'm not a, uh, but, but there must have been some type of uh, reasoning uh, that, that they really fought over in, uh, you know, at the lunch table uh, for all the physicists sitting at the lunch table arguing with each other. They must have said, no, no, that, this is the first law of thermodynamics. We can, but before we have that, we must do start some, this other spot. So that, oh, we need to, wait a minute, how about we make the first one into the second one? No, no, we've already named it. Okay, let's go with the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And that's probably what happened. I don't know. Just, people are All right, so um, I'm going to keep going with this uh, right here, where there's a couple more videos that are going to be for examples. But this is really just the end of the chapter. I have some additional examples from other from the uh, other book. And I think I probably bit off more than I could chew. But this, I was doing the I, ambitions. You know, it's a dangerous thing. Um, so I was ambitious enough. So just some engineering applications and discussion. This is an um, air compressor that you can buy. And it sits on top of an accumulator. This is a big tank. And uh, they fill this, they, they, they start pressing this thing up. And so what happens is now you can use the compressed air. Okay, it'll drop in pressure, but because the thing's so large, it doesn't drop in pressure really quickly. So you can have a pretty good constant pressure worth of supply right in here. Now there's a, a control on here when the pressure does get down ever so slightly, this compressor comes back on and tries to keep the thing pumped up. 
uh, to the right amount. It's kind of an interesting thing, but uh, but it's it's definitely a real life application of a pressure vessel uh, that we might run across and, and see. Here's a guy that you you may or may not uh, uh, know what that is. This is a tire pressure gauge, and uh, I hope you probably still have one in your glove compartment. I think I do. But um, you put this onto the, the, the tire uh, spigot, and this little guy comes out. And you can read off of here, and you can see what the tire pressure gauge is. I think this is, a, I think this is a, another one, but this is with a dial indication on here instead. Um, other applications we might want to see. This right here is a relief valve. Relief valve. And there's a certain type of relief valve also called a safety valve. They're not identical things, but they kind of, you might want to think of them as identical. Anyway, they have like a spring right in here and there's like a little seat. And when this, and, and the pressure in here, if it's enough to overcome the spring, it opens up and it relieves. Uh, so this might be connected to a pipe right here, right? A safety valve is different because once this thing pops, there's another like a little area that gets exposed so it doesn't sit back down when the pressure gets just a little bit smaller than its steam pressure. It actually stays open for longer. It's a, so it's a safety valve. It allows, see, it allows a lot more. So it will drop the pressure. So there's an opening pressure and a different lower closing pressure. Now you know more about safety valves than you want. But they do that on boilers because we don't want the boiler to explode. So this is a, a very important uh, type of feature. If you had a, if you just used a relief valve, this thing could chatter, right? Because it could get just a little bit larger than the setting point, and it opens, it reduces the pressure, boom, it closes. But then it gets a little bit larger, it opens and it closes, and it goes chatter, ch -ch 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 -ch, back and forth right there. That's where this, the problem with the safety valve. Uh, I mean, a relief valve. So you have safety valve. Other applications, you might have a throttle. A throttle opens and closes, and uh, restricts the air that's going to an engine, and that in, it enables us to control the speed of the engine, uh, maintain the speed of the engine. Uh, so, and, and also they have like little tiny holes in them sometimes, right? so they can have like a little bit of pass going on there. Um, is that true? I think it's true. Here is a using a manometer. Here's an application of a manometer. We, it, this is, it works as a flow meter. Right, so what we're able to do is we're able to get what the pressure is. We call this the stagnation pressure. We so we have flow coming through here, and we kind of stop the fluid, which kind of like raises the the pressure. We take some of the velocity uh, energy and turn it into a pressure energy, which is makes this side greater than that side. We also like make a comparison, so it's like this pressure versus that pressure. And what we could do is work it backwards using our good friend Bernoulli. Bernoulli. Bernoulli's equation is a classic energy equation used in fluid mechanics, fluid, fluid dynamics. Very, very useful. It could be overused, but it's a very useful thing. But that by that principle is what we're able to work backwards, figure out what the velocity is. And now we can calculate what the flow is because we have this pressure drop. So this is a flow meter of sorts. Um, it's not the per most precise thing in the world, but it does a good job. Um, this is some type of barometer to try to predict the uh, whether it's going to rain or not. Uh, so the, the, the difference in, in, in pressures, barometric pressures. And here, I've written this down. These are thermocouples. We can um, use electricity resistance and changes in it to measure temperature very accurately if you calibrate uh, these things. Um, I'm also going to mention that we have... Um, a, in every chapter, at the end of every chapter, they have this uh, uh, section. You should look for it. And here are the main equations that we went through um, um, as part of it. So it's like a chapter review, right? F equals ma. Um, didn't really talk about acceleration all that much, but it's the time rate change of velocity, which is the time rate change of position. Good things. Dynamics. Control volume, everything inside the control surface. Uh, specific volume was the volume divided by mass. Density is actually the inverse of specific volume. Uh, pressure definition, force over area. Usually, usually kind of a small type of infinitesimal one is one way that we can mathematically uh, figure out that. Uh, gauge pressure 
is usually going to be, um, we're going to do subtract out the atmospheric pressure. So we, we, it's actually what we see on the gauge most of the time. We don't usually have uh, 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 gauges that read in absolute. Um, and that, uh, that is usually is the atmosphere is the reference that PO is what we're talking about. We have sta uh, static pressure variation in a fluid. So if you were swimming down here with a little snorkel, and you're, you know, if you're swimming and you got your little fins on, no, no terrible, terrible fin. I can draw better than this, I swear. Are you looking up? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the pressure that you feel, right? Let's see, rho uh, g h, or this h right here. Here's the, here's the pressure that your ears are feeling if you're already popping, if you go down too low, right? That's the static pressure variation in a fluid. Um, so also the thing that we use in uh, um, uh, uh, using manometers. Buoyancy force, right? That's uh, um, our good friend Archimedes. It's the volume of the object times the, um, uh, the, the weight density of the thing. And uh, yeah, it's the volume that the thing displaces and multiply it by um, gamma or times density and G. Uh, net force, sure. This is just a free body diagram thing, so I wouldn't bother to look at this. Draw a free body diagram, like I said. We just introduced energy, so it's not really all, these aren't really all that important. Um, here is a way, you want absolute temperature. Very important when we use ideal gas law, always use the absolute temperatures, either in Kelvin or in Rankine, depending on whether they're SI or not. And then the unit for conversion table. So there you go, 16 minutes into it. I bet if I added up all of these videos, it would be way longer than 75 minutes. Um, I bit off more than I could chew, but uh, I don't know what are you gonna do. We'll see. So let's uh, call it an end.